Well, it's my distinct pleasure at this point to introduce the fifth uh, Schwartz lecturer. I could stand here for about 20 minutes and list accolades and tell stories about somebody who means a great deal to me, uh, but I won't take that long. I do want to tell you about uh, Dr. Michael Edwards. Dr. Edwards is a native of Georgia. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia and then went to medical school at Emory. He was then trained as a resident surgeon at the University of Louisville under Dr. Hiram C. Polk, one of the uh, preeminent surgical leaders of, of our time. Upon completing a fellowship in uh, general surgery, uh, Dr. Edwards then went to the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where he pursued a surgical oncology fellowship, followed one year later by a young surgical oncology fellow named David Sloan. After completing his surgical oncology fellowship at uh, the MD Anderson, he returned to the University of Louisville, where he took his first faculty position under Dr. Polk, and then rose there through the ranks when he was associate professor of surgery at the University of Louisville. That is when I met Dr. Edwards. He was at that time conducting breast ultrasound courses throughout the nation. I was in the laboratory at the time, and he extended an invitation to me to come over and learn breast ultrasound in one of their courses at the University of Louisville. He rose to the rank of professor of uh, surgery and chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology at Louisville, and then accepted the position of professor and chairman at the University of Arkansas. He served in that position and as chief of staff at the University Hospital there until November 2007 when he moved to the University of Cincinnati to assume uh, the chair role at the University of Cincinnati. He's currently the Christian R. Holmes professor and chair there and serves as Vice President for System Development. He's been responsible, along with the Dean, for coalescing 17 different physician practices into one unified practice plan in a similar model to what we have here at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Edwards is recognized nationally and internationally as a surgeon, surgical specialist in surgical oncology, and as a healthcare leader he served on numerous committees, executive positions, and as president for national professional societies. He's been funded continuously uh, for almost 20 years through the VA, the NIH. He's been PI or co-PI, responsible for over $15 million in what his CV considers to be major funding, uh, but that's followed by 24 other funded uh, external projects and grants for which he's been PI. He's on the editorial board or is reviewer for almost two dozen prominent surgical journals. He's an inventor, has designed numerous surgical devices and founded a number of development companies. He's published over 250 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 18 book chapters. Uh, he has been guest lecturer or invited uh, uh, speaker over 50 times at major universities. He's also an alpine skier and a climber. Uh, he does that uh, most often from his home uh, that uh, he and his wife Carol own in Jackson, Wyoming, which I've discovered is just a few hours from the Wind River Range, and uh, perhaps I can um, get an opportunity to stay at, uh, at the Edwards home there and take advantage of some of that. To relax, Dr. Edwards uh, races automobiles is the real deal, actually. He owns Edwards Motorsports. He holds a license to race motorsports in the United States and in Europe under the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile. He is, for real, a semi-professional, I would say, race car driver. His son is a, is a ranked uh, race car driver in the United States and in Europe. And maybe he can tell us a little story about that. If, if, if he doesn't get to that in the Schwartz Lecture, I encourage you to ask him uh, or Carol about that tonight at the, um, at the reception. Uh, Dr. Edwards is, is foremost just like Richard Swartz. He's a surgeon's surgeon. He is a revered educator, and he's a great friend. And, and it's, it's my honor to introduce him here and welcome him as our Thank Schwartz Andrew. lecture. Mike. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Well, it's a real treat for me to come back to my adopted home state of Kentucky. Um, I got to know Richard Swartz when uh, I was 
at attending here, and um, I didn't know him well. Uh, but I think I know, knew enough about him. Um, he had an infectious smile, uh, a contagious optimism, and we would see him at uh, events like the ultrasound course. We would see him at uh, events like the Kentucky chapter of events, uh, programs put on between UK and U of L. Um, and I really uh, came to really appreciate his optimism and the way that he engaged um, the work of the day, but also just the way he engaged life through the experiences and especially the relationships that he built over time. You don't just name a lecture for a person who isn't deserving, and I, I can tell you that I knew from the first time I met him he would be deserving. Um, I think if he were here with us today, he would tell you uh, as surgeons, during the days we live now, we have more power to do good with great medicines, with great imaging, uh, with great tools than we've ever had. And I can tell you today, I know of no prior time uh, to be practicing surgery, the noble calling, uh, than to be a surgeon today who's, as I say, earned validated self-respect. And we're going to talk a little bit today about self-respect because at the end of the day, it's your happiness is going to stem largely from the person that knows you best, and that's you. And so uh, you could go to an M&M, &M and you can pay lip service to a complication and hurt a patient and sweep it under the rug, and I guarantee you, you will not be nearly as happy or content with yourself or as honest with yourself as you should be. But if you go to an M&M &M and you confess your sins, absolve yourself of a bad decision, a bad technical move, and then you can put it behind you and you can move on. And then, when you lay down at night, you can think about yourself and try to become a better person. No, true nobility as a surgeon stems from trying to be a better person tomorrow or today than I was yesterday. And so, I want to, in this talk, speak a little bit about the nouns that define us and help us derive um, self-respect, the nouns that define us and help us derive satisfaction in surgery, the, the things that we do as people, uh, as surgeons, to engage our personal and professional lives, and how we can experience the glory, the true glory that, that is surgery. The problem and I saw that in Richard. He, he lived the glory that was surgery. If you see him lecturing, if you see him teaching, you knew that he, he really enjoyed and had that optimism. But today we're faced with an issue called surgeon burnout. And I think burnout is actually a euphemism for depression and frustration. First frustration and then often depression. And you wonder, how, how can surgeons be burned out? Um, but evidently they are. It's not just a phenomenon we've labeled. I did this uh, search on Monday, and uh, if you look at each of the time periods, uh, you can see that um, the number of references in the PubMed literature have really spiked since 2009 in terms of the surgeons that since burnout. And as a chairman of a department of surgery, I have 74 faculty and 95 trainees. Um, and I think that the article that said that many of them experience emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, but most importantly, and this, I want to focus on this one aspect, a less of a sense of accomplishment. And in fact, in some cases, they are accomplishing less. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can avoid that. You know, I'm going to give you a list of the problems that we face today. But... When I was coming along, Humana was buying University Hospital and making our lives miserable and taking the capital equipment out of the hospital and undercapitalizing everything, and we were pretty miserable with that. So I think we've just swapped one uh, set of miseries of the past for some of the miseries of the modern era. And I don't think they're more severe now than they were then. It is true uh, in many institutions that we've lost control to hospital administrators, and I would encourage you, if you're a young resident looking to take a job, Think about taking a job where you are part of the management team within a health system, and we have to work hard in academic centers to see that we're affiliated as leaders and managers in hospital systems as opposed to sophisticated blue-collar workers. There is no question that burnout can become severe. Depression can become severe when you get sued. It is an emotionally draining process having been through it 
having won and, and having lost at least one small suit. Um, if you've got a difficult, obnoxious partner, get out of that relationship. It's easier than a divorce. Move on. I, I like the smile. Um, but seriously, there are toxic relationships with partners that can really cause a, a surgeon not to fulfill the joy and the glory of surgery. And I will tell you that I think today's typical two-couple families where both are professionals has imposed another really very serious uh, difficulty that does make work-life balance hard and stresses, stresses those families perhaps more than we would see 30 years ago. I hate the EMR. I don't think it's more efficient. And, you know, we all have the dashboard abuse where we're faced with how many RVUs have you put up and all the d different metrics, and this is the general stress. But once again, I don't think that these things are that much different than what we faced years ago, and I still believe that, as Blake Ketty says, surgery is the prince of the sciences. It's the queen of the arts. So as I began to talk and experience faculty who had some of these feelings, I start to look at it uh, much in the same way that Viktor Frankl wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. He was a Holocaust survivor and a psychiatrist and came back and talked about his epiphany that in the most extreme of suffering and anticipation of the absolute worst outcome, he discovered how important his relationships in life were. Um, a little bit of the next portion of this talk is going to be uh, a, a few things that I, as a 63-year-old chair of surgery, have uh, found as I have searched for a surgeon's meaning in life. It's very important as you move forward in life, you have certain things. Uh, you need a car, a house, um, food, <laughs> um, but don't overdo the things. Your happiness will not come from owning an expensive purse, uh, a fancy Porsche, um, or things nearly as much as it will come from your experiences in life, be it listening to music, looking at the Grand Tetons, catching a trout on a fly rod, talking with your wife over a glass of wine, um, or more importantly, you'll, your, your, your happiness will come through relationships with your patients, doing your patients well. And David Richardson, I guess, is a person who, who mentioned to me first the, concept that when you get out of bed as a surgeon, you go to work every day to have a powerful impact on everybody's lives and to do the right thing. It's not like you're selling a widget. So these relationships can be a really, um, and I think, I think Richard understood that. He had great relationships and he had a beaming smile and he was optimistic and he found meaning in life in his constant pursuit of doing things as he looked at a world and saw order and chaos and had an impact, an intervention by which he brought chaos into order. And you do that not only in your day job in terms of draining pus, for example, but you ought to be doing that in trying to be a better friend. You ought to be doing that in trying to be, my wife does, will say I haven't done as great a job as a better husband, uh, a better father. Um, and if you work on those things, I think you can, you can really make progress. I think it's interesting talking to the millennials and talking to the next generation uh, how they want to save the world and how they have these ideological views of utopia um, and have very simplistic views of what you need to do to solve the problems of global health uh, when most of them can't even clean their room. Uh, so I would encourage you to, if you want to bring order in life, get some experience doing it before you try to, uh, to prescribe utopia and before you become a victim and blame everybody else. Uh, so, you know, this is a picture. The first thing we want to think about in terms of the opportunity to find meaning in life is to create order just into things around you. This is uh, Admiral William McRaven uh, giving a, a lecture to graduating um, a college group. And if you haven't seen this uh, video, you really need to, really need to see it. Here, here are the, a group of SEALs, toughest guys around doing some of the most important work on Earth. And the way they begin to understand how to become important in life is by making the bed. It's, but if we go beyond uh, those things, how do surgeons do it? They're, those are the things that we do in yellow. And I want you to think just for a second, pause. This is the reality we live in. We are incredibly powerful individuals as we transform the chaos of disease and sickness to health and wealth. As we take data, create it first, differentiate it into information, figure out how to apply it, it becomes knowledge, 
And then eventually some of that data becomes wisdom. We take suffering, we provide comfort, we take naive medical students whose vision of things is almost like puppies with their eyes closed, and we actually educate them so that they become compassionate doctors. So I guess part of my message here is much in the way I looked at Richard Schwartz. I saw an individual that understood that he elegantly imposed his will on the world through his work and caused these transformations to occur. Your personal acts of work, be it in your personal life, your professional life, your activities to create value will be your genuine sources of personal fulfillment. And anybody who tells you otherwise is either, well, I won't go into that. They're wrong. Now, here's the problem that we get into in surgery and a problem that I want to bring out where I think a lot of unhappiness comes from. The cartoon says, I agree you have drive, ambition, and self-confidence, but what we're looking for is competence. And so within the field of surgery, there is a ziggurat, if you will, of competence. Can you do it? And candidly, there are things in surgery that I don't need to be doing. I don't have the mentality to work with pediatricians. I, I can't do it or won't do it. I wouldn't be happy if I tried to do it. Um, I did have the technical ability to become a congenital heart surgeon, which in many ways is the pinnacle of that ziggurat, because I was technically superior. But I'm not Andrew Bernard. I don't have the patience of Solomon, and I can't tolerate intrusions into my daily schedule. I need a very structured, very scheduled life. So the idea that some pediatrician would present with me a child that I had to interrupt my day and do an emergency just meant that that was out the door for me. You really need to start to understand who you are as residents, particularly when you think about subspecializing. The problem I see with burnout so often, at least in my faculty, is when we have someone trying to do heart surgery who really ought to be a breast surgeon. That's a serious problem. And I see it time and time again. So think about your choices in life and before you try to transform something, make sure you're a fit for that particular field. Make sure that you have the physical ability, the mental ability, the organizational skills, and if you're going to be doing sophisticated congenital heart surgery, you better be a natural technician. Um, you don't really need to be jumping through those hurdles. And that's one caution I have for you. Uh, today. These hierarchies of competence are desirable and they need to be promoted. I currently believe that what is going to happen in American surgery is something very different. Right now we train you based on time. That is going to end. In the future you will be trained and you will acquire certain knowledge base. It will be verified by testing. You will acquire a technical base and then you'll be qualified to do a breast biopsy and then a port, and then a trait, and then maybe a mastectomy or a partial mastectomy. You might get comprehensively qualified by your PGY3 year to be a comprehensive breast surgeon, and at that point, as far as I'm concerned, you could quit because you could be credentialed and privileged to go into practice and do that, and I think within 10 to 15 years, this is the way the model is going to work because right now, our credentialing and privileging process for kids finishing training and surgery is broken. What that means is, is that you can jump off the ziggurat doing the more simple stuff much earlier on in a truncated surgical training program and genuinely be capable to do what your credentialing papers say, which is not true today. I feel a little dirty each time I sign off on these credentialing papers where I say you're qualified to do the whole spectrum of general surgery because I know darn well you're not. And this pertains to everyone. And I will tell you in Cincinnati, I'm not talking about a bad training program. I'm talking about training some highly qualified people that get the most competitive fellowships who can operate independently. So as we move from a ziggurat, if you, and I, I hope I don't offend your specialties because I was a breast surgeon, but that's at the bottom of general surgery. And then we move up to things like, oh, I have to say it, endocrine. Um, and, then <laughs> and then we move maybe to a more isolated organ like colorectal. And then we move to something a little more sophisticated uh, maybe it's trauma and critical care. 
And then we get into the highly technical specialties of surgical oncology, transplantation, heart surgery, vascular surgery, and then congenital heart surgery. Uh, I think these hierarchies of competence, it's tough to, it's tough to, to achieve the, those, those abilities. And it may take you 12 years. But that's where we're going. And you'll see it in your lifetime if you're one of the residents today. So let's assume that you are gifted technically, intellectually, um, and you can do anything. The question, though, then becomes, will you do it? And this is a reflection of not only your abilities, but also your character. And as you move forward in life, you have to say, if it requires that sacrifice, am I willing to make it? As opposed to commit to a call schedule or a, a nighttime life, if you will, in liver transplantation, are you really committed uh, to do it? And as you step forward, if we think about it, we have to examine how well are we doing in terms of the virtues of life? Do we have the kind of integrity and discernment we need as a person? Uh, in our relationships, do we love the way we should respect and have humility? And when it comes time to act, are we diligent, thorough, in assessing things before we act? Do we show temperance as we act? And do we have the courage, once we have done those two, to move forward with the right action at the right time? Um, I think that I don't mind telling you, none of you are perfect, but I also tell you I'm not either, of course. And I, I, I have many bad uh, aspects. I will tell you my reputation is limited by my weakest virtue, one of which is empathy. And it is true, I went to the Harvard Business School and was studying business and scored fifth percentile in empathy. Uh, you should laugh a little bit there, because I also scored 99th percentile in productivity. Uh, but I, I promise you that I am seen by my fellow chairs and other faculty as not having the empathy, and I have to constantly work on that. And you also need to remember Achilles was only as strong as his heel. So examine these things, though, and think about who you are and how that plays out in your daily living and how it affects your, your happiness. So as we go back to work and we talk about finding meaning in these transformations and the creation of value for patients, for your family, for your relationships with your family, and what I'm seeing today in every movement you want to talk about is people claiming victimhood with group identity, espousing blame, excuses, and denial as opposed to personal ownership, accountability, and responsibility. Your happiness is going to start when you stop blaming somebody else and start acting for yourself. I promise you that. Accountable behaviors. Richard Swartz, things happened because of him. That's what I want you to remember about him. Things happened when he walked into the room and he engaged a group and he was talking about agenda and you saw that enthusiasm. You saw him taking action. He assessed reality, embraced it, found solutions, and made it happen. I never heard him once say an unkind word. I didn't went around him a lot, uh, for a lot, but I never heard him say an inappropriate bad thing about uh, anyone. And certainly, he certainly didn't blame anybody for his fate. Um, if you want to be successful, start by making your bed and then very quickly become an accountable individual that assumes your rightful place. There is nothing wrong with being powerful. In its purest definition, power is work per unit time. It just means that you're able to leverage your influence and you're able to get more work done. Don't shy away from being powerful. How do you become powerful? Well, first, as a surgeon, go into a field that you're qualified to do where you're a personal personality fit, a technical ability fit, a mental fit, and then do things well. And then as you do things well and you become as good as you can be caring for one patient at a time, students, colleagues, peers will want to see how you do it and emulate you. You've become a role model. And so when we talk about teachers at the University of Cincinnati, we talk about role models. That's your goal, to become a, a deserving role model where people say, I want to be like Andrew. Once you get to that point, you've just acquired the base to become a leader. Now, anybody know what the opposite of a leader is? 
It's not a follower. The opposite of a leader is a helpless, blame-ridden victim. Okay? If you see the skies falling, I want somebody in my department who sees opportunity and says the time is right for me. And so that's how you're going to find happiness is when you see chaos and you see an opportunity to create order. Now here's, here's one thing I will point out. If you saw the, the overlapping Venn diagram, I'm going to go back to that. What, what was interesting that I didn't tell you is the guy in the middle, that guy's got a chance to be happy. You move him out here, and he's just bored. He has nothing to do, really. You move him over here, and, and what's a good example of that? A kid in Appalachia with no real hope of even getting a foot in the middle to be empowered to transform chaos. We owe it to those people in the inner city and in, in, in the places where there's so much chaos and opioids and everything else in their life to get them back in here in the middle so that they can really start to become powerful individuals that engage life and have an impact. Yeah, it's a philosophical talk a little bit. I'm an amateur philosopher, I guess, as I get older. Um, certainly not a psychiatrist, thank God. Um, one, one, one thing I'd just say to, to, to the, the young people in the crowd is uh, realize you're not perfect, and, um, but begin to address those things, and certainly don't sacrifice who you are, um, or sacrifice who you could be for who you are and work to earn this validated self-respect. I want to say validated self-respect. Each of you should have at least four or five harsh critics. Andy's not one of mine. He says too many kind things about me. He's, he's not the best friend he could be, because if we actually got closer and a little more intimate, he'd really be more honest with me and tell me what I really should do differently. My wife's pretty damn good at that. Um, so my wife is an incredible friend of mine, and my son's an even better friend in many ways because he actually tells me what, where I was out of line and out of bounds, and you better have somebody like that. And you don't earn self-respect until you have harsh critics. So most of you owe it to yourself, and most of you don't even have this already. Most of you don't have people that will come to you and sit you down and tell you that you could dress better, that you could speak differently that you could be a better person, that you could be more fair, that you could have many more of those other virtues, and you need that. Because after you have that and you accept that criticism and you act on it, only then can you start to be anything other than delusional and earn self-respect. So I'll wind this up by saying one advice in terms of avoiding burnout, don't endeavor to become a specialist that you know where you're not going to do it well enough, and that means to do it really well so that you're know as, you know that you're as good and efficient and effective as anybody in that specialty. And if you're not, I promise you, you'll be, subject, you'll, you'll be subjected to burnout. I'm going to move on now and talk about surgeons and our missions. And clearly, uh, we care for patients. We continue through lifelong learning. We leverage what we know to others in teaching and we work to advance our state of the art. And, and we really help people, as I talked earlier about coronary atherosclerotic heart disease. While we can't cure that disease, we ensure palliative relief, chest pain, and increased survival time among uncured patients. And in some malignancies and in diseases like appendicitis, we can actually provide cures. We can transform people to live life expectancies equivalent to those who never had the disease, age match cohorts. Academic surgeons, I'm an academic surgeon, and I was woefully um, out of touch as a junior and even mid-level resident in terms of realizing that um, there's this continuum. As you take care of one patient at a time and you really get good at it, you become a role model. People are asking you how you did it. As you begin to explain that to them, you become a good role model and a good teacher. They appreciate that. People like great teachers like Frank Miller, who I appreciated, and Richard. And then you invariably start talking about better ways of doing things, how to, how to stage people with Sentinel Node, how to develop and revise that te technique, and then you wind up making discoveries. That continuum 
is surgery. Some of you will opt to only work in the clinical side of it and have very minimal roles in the teaching and discovery side. You're giving up something. Don't give that up unless you have to give that up. Because while we call them academic surgeons, I, I view it as part of surgery. I learned this, and I made this quote up when I was a resident, which is uh, watching Hiram Polk. And I tried to put together a sentence that would embody what he inspired in so many of his trainees. And that is that satisfaction, I never heard the boss say that anything was ever OK. It was either, that's world class, that's first class, there are two other institutions in North America that could accomplish that, or, or that's the worst da, 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 case I've ever seen. Mark, Mark's smiling. But he, he realized that satisfaction with mediocrity is a cancer. It invades your mind, and it destroys your pursuit of excellence. You, you don't want to just be doing something in a mundane way. You want to know that you're doing it well, and that's why your specialty choice and your spectrum of practice should be something that you're expert at. But even though you may be as good as you get and you're content with that, you're still going to hurt some people. When you hurt people, boy, that can lead to burnout. And we all do it. Charles Bosk was a, a, a psychologist uh, who followed around um, a surgery group in Chicago back in the 70s and wrote the Sentinel publication, forgive and remember, on how surgeons were held accountable. And I alluded to it earlier. And when we criticize our internists to do manipulations of the pancreatic duct and cause trouble, um, they don't have the benefit we have. We have decades of understanding that we operate on somebody, they either bleed or don't bleed, get infected or don't get infected, live or die. We have visible outcomes. When we do elective surgery, we have an anticipation of success, and we have a short frame for that feedback to occur to know that we got it right. And because surgery was the first discipline to really cause visible harm, we created tools to manage that. I want to speak a little bit about that, because in every operation, there's risk and there's reward. And you as a surgeon are endowed, and that's where the glory comes from, because you're hurting people. But you're trusted to hurt people in the name of doing something better for them. And, and I say, heavy is this accountable head that wears this wonderful crown of surgery. So what we did as a discipline, going back to the early days of the American Surgical, the Southern and others, we implemented structures to define for the profession our conscience. In other words, we had these national bodies to make sure that as new operations were rolled out, that they reliably achieved the results that we wanted them to achieve, and that as we populated communities with surgeons, that they were getting the results. We created very exclusive organizations. Uh, American was established in 1880. And these icons in the world of surgery who were trusted for their abilities, their knowledge, and most of all, their integrity, came together, they met, and then they sanctioned various operations, and then they sent the members back, and they were brought into the organization on a local basis. So that they go back to their communities, and these gods were told that you are to crush the deviations from our accepted standards in the name of safety, and in the purification of the practice of surgery in the country of North America. And that's the way the American worked. That's the way the Southern worked. And it isn't an accident that Dr. Polk in 1971 was a tough, tough guy, as was Joe Fisher, as was candidly Ward Griffin in a little more elegant way, I might say, though. Um, but it was their job to make sure the deviations from standard of care did not occur. And so we developed a culture where M&M actually meant something and it was done properly. And we made failure, as we knew we would fail, something that was analyzed and it became an accountable feature of our daily life. As a result of that, we as a discipline embraced this sort of collective consciousness, our conscious of making sure we did the right thing. And our, our processes, our procedures, our national organizations, unlike any other medical specialty, held us as individuals accountable. So when you talk about these proceduralists in medicine, that's why they cath somebody who's 92 years old and put a tav around them. Because if, if they're incentivized by RVUs, that just happened a couple of weeks ago in Cincinnati, and I'm beside myself because they're not really thinking about the patient. Surgeons wouldn't do that. Heavy is the accountable head wearing the crown. 
of surgery. And, and when we assess our bad outcomes for a patient, it begins with what could I, not somebody else, do differently. And so when somebody says anesthesia, I say, why don't you have a better relationship with anesthesia so we can control them and get them to do the right thing? So it comes back to you, even in terms of your relationships. So how do we handle failure? Now I'm going to digress and tell you a story from when I was 12 years old. Um, so my dad was a hunter, and we raised uh, bird dogs and trained bird dogs for rich guys in Atlanta. And um, my dad was a really good shot. And so one morning we turned the dogs loose, we started walking, and we went down, found the hog pen covey, a couple of other coveys. My dad pulled the trigger seven times and killed eight birds. The so last time he shot, he waited until the crossed and killed two with one shot. And I didn't kill a bird. Um, and um, so we went to Etheridge's uh, store, and while we're in Etheridge's store, Dwight and uh, Clark and his dad uh, were there, and uh, they were talking about their great dogs, really. And uh, they were talking about uh, the fact that Dwight had shot a triple that morning. Well, my dad had shot two, 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 uh, two triples, and I guess a, a double, but with only seven shots. And uh, so I'm listening to all this, and um, I'm looking at my dad, and I'm drinking a Yahoo. Uh, it goes down real fast. It doesn't last very long, these Yahoos. Um, chocolate drink and um, pot belly stove. And my dad looks at me, and he says, well, son, you ready to go? I was too afraid to prod him to tell them what he had done that morning, but I was so angry that he wouldn't tell them. We walked outside, and he said, let me tell you something when I asked him why he didn't tell them. He said, there's two kinds of hunters in the world. He said, there's those like them that talk about the ones they shot. He said, and there's them guys like me that just talk about the ones they missed, and I didn't have much to say. And I think so when you think about that story and how it affected me for a lifetime, what I've seen over the lifetime in David Richardson, Hiram Polk, Andrew Bernard, David Sloan, Pat McGrath, all these guys and gals that have worked with me, Mary, Mary Fallot, um, what I see is great people who have attained incredible happiness in life, who are very good at what they do, are a perfect fit for what they're trying to do for their patients, who hold themselves to an incredibly high standard. And really, because they're so good, it's easy for them to focus and be honest and talk about the ones they missed as they get better and better and better and enjoy life more and more and more every day. That's the formula I want to tell you about for surgery. Your happiness and fulfillment will come from achieving your outcome every time and, in many cases, in the face of uncooperative individuals and obstacles. Of all disciplines, surgery has nurtured, demanded the most trustworthy commitment to the sacred bond we know and revere as this doctor-patient relationship. There is not another specialty that has done this as well as general surgery and the ultimate general surgery subspecialties. This, more than any other factor, is your segregating career choice and the genesis of your sense of duty. In fact, your clinical superiority, and there's not any there's no reason to, to deny it, at least in my view. You, you, the people who are clinically superior are the general internists who are dedicated to the patients training in great places like Emory where I think they were even better than the surgeons, and really those that comprehensively care for the patients in the best way. It will give you glory, and it will affirm your identity as a surgeon. So don't put yourself in the position of being weak or weaker uh, by how you choose to practice. I think that um, when we think about surgery and we think about ego, um, I say this to the applicants when they come in. Um, your ego is a collection of beliefs about oneself that embodies the answer to who am I? And I got to tell you, if society is endowing you with the opportunity to hurt somebody and to make an incision and you have earned it, and you've earned it because of your superior intellect, and you've earned it because of your superior ability and your integrity, I, I'm not going to go into denial and tell you you're not superior because you are. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't adhere to all the other virtues of humility and everything else and carry yourself and interact with ED docs and all the other specialties the way that you should, because you should, and you should be a gentleman and a lady. 
But if you could do what we're asking of surgeons to do today, which is massively difficult, then, then you ought to take some pride in who you are. And it's not about your ego. The problem with that little picture is your ego, that's too small. Your ego can never be too large if your other virtues are intact. And so you have to keep all those other virtues attended to. It's okay to have a big ego. You think that Dean McKenzie, who does congenital heart surgery in Houston, Texas, walks into that operating room with a tiny ego? You crazy? He knows how good he is. He knows he's one of the five best congenital heart surgeons in the world. Jim Tweddle at Children's Hospital, he knows he's one of the, he may be the best congenital heart surgeon in the world. But he's also a gentleman. There's nothing wrong with knowing it. There's a, there's a lot wrong with abusing it. Your ego can't be too large if your virtues are intact. Richard Swartz had a big ego. He knew how good he was. I bet Janet would tell you that. <laughs> so you'll find true happiness when you secure the approval of yourself, knowing that your principles are superior and that you adhere to those, uh, those virtues. So let's think about the nouns that define us. If you notice on my coat, it doesn't say chairman. It doesn't say professor. It says surgeon. There is no more noble noun. When you walk into my office, it says surgeon on the wall. Everything else that describes me is an objective. I am not a surgical oncologist. Please don't call me that. I'm not a clinical educator, a clinical scientist, a clinical attending. I am an oncologic surgeon. I am a teaching surgeon. I am an academic surgeon. I am an attending surgeon. Don't insult me and call me something else. I've earned it. It is glorious to be a surgeon. I'm also a professor and chair, but that's not nearly uh, anything I revere the way I revere being a surgeon. I will tell you, I began as a son, as many of you began as a daughter. Very fortunate to have a loving mother and wonderful dad who supported me. I became a student and a friend, and I was oftentimes not the friend I should have been. I was an okay student. I did make 10, 20 on the SAT, so I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack, that's for certain. I bet Mark Evers did better than that. Um, and then I became a husband, and probably that's the relationship I probably failed as much in terms of revering the, the role I should have. I uh, went on to become, this is me as an intern, uh, got my degree at Emory, became a physician, became Dr. Polk's intern, uh, their re resident, eventually an MD Anderson fellow. And then I, I paid attention to those things. I've been blessed to live an incredible life. Dr. Schwartz lived an incredible life. And I think that we're very grateful that we've lived life big. And if you want to live life big, honor your nouns, honor the relationships you have, honor the virtues, and try to put yourself into a position where you can form at a high level. During the days we now live, I know of no more noble calling than to be a surgeon who has honored his nouns, paid attention to the virtues, chosen the field where you're, you're the real deal and you're a real leader performing at a high level and then you've earned self-respect. Thank you for your attention. A little philosophical. Fantastic. I don't know about that. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to get the questions uh, started here. When I visited Cincinnati, um, you mentioned something to me that, that uh, you reminded me of here. It relates to your attention to virtues. Yeah and the priorities that you choose to set for yourself. And uh, it was that you called your dad every day. While he was father, sick, yes. I my father every day while he's sick. Right. I remind him to take his medicine. Yeah. To do his job. And that was my mom also, right. My yeah. mom. Yeah. Well, I, I have a saying that uh, when I'm dealing with surgeons who want to kill somebody or they have had unprofessional behavior, um, I, I tell them, uh, and I usually give them some of this, but I say, when you get home from work, Pour 30 cc's of Woodford Reserve, sip it, pet your dog, don't have cats, <laughs> and kiss your wife. And if you are still feeling angry and frustrated, repeat. And if you still feel angry and frustrated, call me and, and come over. 
And, and a corollary to that, which is tragic, is that I had a congenital heart surgeon, a fantastic man, very temperamental, hot-tempered guy. And he did want to kill somebody. Um, and he did come over. My lovely wife, Carol, served dinner to him and his partners as we tried to harmonize the relationships. We made some progress. But then on Christmas Day that year, I got a phone call when I was skiing with my family in Beaver Creek. Um, telling me that the bur bottle of bar bourbon I'd given him, he'd actually washed down a bottle of Vicodin and killed himself. Um, so, you know, the stress that we incur is real. Um, we do have to encounter people who don't see the world the way we do, who put up obstacles, who are not as committed as we are, and we still have to figure out ways to work with them and around them. And poor Jonathan was, uh, I worked with him hard, but I really felt I had to wonder if I could have done more. But I do think it's important, you know, I call my mom every day now. Uh, my dad has passed away. Um, we were privileged to allow him to die at home without being admitted to the, to the, to the hospital, which was kind of cool. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think you should definitely do that and maintain your role as a son and a daughter, even if you're in your 60s. Uh, I think it's really important. Can you contrast for us the harsh critic versus the mentor? Tell us how to find that harsh critic, those harsh critics. We need a, a couple. Yeah. Well, uh, as Mark can tell you, uh, I didn't have to invite Dr. Polk to be a harsh critic. And, um, and uh, even when I became chair in Cincinnati, I invited him to Cincinnati, and I said, don't hold back. I said, tell me the things I'm doing well and the things I can do better. I thought I was doing more well uh, when he got done with me. Um, but he's, a, he's like, I actually loved him, but I think more of my father uh, because he, he really invested energy in me. And, and, uh, but he, he was my hardest, meanest critic. And most of the times he was right. Sometimes he was absolutely wrong, as Mark knows. Um, but you got to invite him. You got to bring these people in. I brought David Richards in. David Richards can be, be a tough guy. And he's a little kinder and higher, but he's one of my, my critics. Frank Miller was never really a critic to me. He, he glossed things over, but he was a great friend. Carol's a pretty tough critic. My son John is probably the worst critic I got. Um, he can be cruel with his criticism, but, um, uh, but you got to have them. And you really can't validate yourself in any way until you really ask those people to, to provide you feedback. And, and, and you hopefully you can earn the right to be a harsh critic in somebody else's life. But it's important, and it's just candor. My wife reminds me, Carol's here, I, I just saw her back there, <laughs> thank you for coming, that uh, also I, I have a marriage with her, not a residency, so um, that uh, there is a different set of relationships. I thought I'd get a real laugh out of that, Carol. So. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I think you need critics and you need uh, friends and different people play different roles. Um, I, I will say, I don't know if I have it, this is something that that I have on my desk is how, how you get a contentment, a life fulfilled, little regret, goals revered, sometimes met. To those who watch us try and fail, stayed resolved with show and tell. It's not for them. It's not applause. It's self-respect, the worthy cause. I think that's how you find meaning in life, genuine self-respect. Pity those who do not know a personal limit, their bar so low. Blisters, aches, blood, and sweat, bills we pay to seal our debt. Self-respect earned by few. Find your limit, pay your due. Nor win nor loss, the outcome meant honored goals, our life's work spent. Self-respect earned is billed. Now tis ours a life fulfilled. And I think that what that is trying to say is that we should all have goals that are based on that one foot in chaos and order, our goals are to make those transformations occur. Our goals are to make life better for somebody else, for ourselves. Um, our goals should not be simply to blame, excuse. Our goals should be, how can I become powerful, accountable, responsible, accountable, and powerful, and really cause great good things to happen so that my life and other lives are, are enriched? It's the goals. You don't always succeed. You sometimes meet them. Um, but the people I admire, those men and women in the trenches, I don't know that Evers are able to cure cancer. He's working toward it. Um, but 
He certainly has a good set of goals. He reveres them. He works at it diligently. He has stayed resolved. And I'm quite sure when he lays down at night, he's got some serious self-respect and a massive ego. <laughs> All right. I have one more. Okay. Uh, I want the crowd to have an opportunity to ask a question, too. You love studying sphingolipids. I do. And uh, you skipped the sphingolipid meeting in Israel last week because the resident interview day fell. Yeah, when you on the Wednesday, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't actually don't rank the residents. Um, so what I do is I try to just be the irritant, like Ross Perot, remember he said, I'm the grain of sand that makes the oyster make the pearl? Well, that's what I am in the interview process. I'm there to put four people into the room and say to one of them, uh, what's the weakest part of your application? And she says, I didn't do any research. I said, no, that's not it. You made 215 or 225 on step one. That's your problem. And then if she can't take that, and she, if her ego is so damn fragile that she can't take some little criticism like that, how the hell do you think she's going to do down in front of me in the amphitheater talking about a patient she damn near killed? But if she could say, yeah, that's a pretty bad score, um, but she still realizes she's a wonderful, good person, there's a reason I tell you I made 10, 20 on the SAT. I want you to know I'm not very bright. Um, but... But you've got to have an ego. And if you've got an ego, then I can make a surgeon out of you. But if you don't have an ego and you're offended by that and you're just some weakly, weak person who wants to sit and talk and blame the chairman of surgery for being inappropriate, well, then great. Train in Indianapolis with Gary Dunnington. You just answered the question. <laughs> Well, I will say this. I look for interns who are as tough as $2 bills, have skin as hard as steel, and breath as hard as kerosene. That's from Towns Van Zandt, by the way. But, uh, yeah, you want a tough kid. Um, as Hiram said, he said to me, I called him, and I was crowing about uh, the, the, the match and the scores we had this seven, eight years ago, and I was telling him how great this entering, entering class was. He said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, why, oh, right, Dr. Paul, why, why is this a bad thing? And he said, well, you just basically just brought in a completely entitled group of interns. They all know, think they're God's God gift to Cincinnati, and you're going to have trouble with them. He said, I'll tell you something, son. He said, the kids that are going to be your best surgeons and your best leaders are kids that are, just don't know how dumb they are. He said, you know, if they've scored less on the exam, but they're determined, if their mama was a teacher, um, and they've been raised right, he said, you know who they are. Those are the kids you want to bring in there. And they'll turn out to be something in surgery. And they might even turn out to be a leader someday. You want somebody who's, you know, not too smart, reasonably dumb. Somebody like you. <laughs> somebody like you. I thought, is that a, is that a compliment? <laughs> but I do, think, I do think there's something about grit. And so you need a baseline IQ. You don't need a super IQ. You need a baseline IQ. You need lots of grit. The best surgery resident I ever trained is a kid named Cutler Quillen. And he was right here from, uh, his dad owns the bridle shop that makes all the bridles for the horses, Quillen Leather. I'm sure you've seen it. And he worked in that leather shop for the family business. And he was a smart kid and he came in and I, when I met him, the same thing happened with me with him as happened with Dean McKenzie when I realized he was a congenital heart surgeon the first day I met him. I looked at Cutler, and I came up and I told Carol, I said, I've met the young man who will embody everything I ever wanted to train in a surgeon. He's not perfect, but he's going to become a superstar. And on October 28, 2015, Jean Ahmad from Columbia called me and said, I just want you to know Quillen's here and doing well, and I've never had a young man join my faculty who knew more and who was as technically gifted and superior as this young fellow. And he said, and by the way, this old Kentucky boy has got impeccable integrity, as you know. I said, yeah, he's like a son to me. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for kids that um, have a background. They've shown some proclivity to leadership. They don't lie and exaggerate and tell me that they, you know, or have all these crazy interests and hobbies and do all this community service, and it's all a bunch of lies. I don't care about that stuff. Uh, if you worked in your family business, if you're a first-generation immigrant, uh, if you've suffered, 
Uh, if you've had some kind of minor leadership deal, you got a baseline IQ and you got hunger, you know, then you can get there. All right. Glorious to be a servant. <laughs> it is. <laughs> relationships. Relationships were really important to Richard. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue the event and the celebration of Richard's life, um, further developing our relationships over glass of wine. Uh, Carson and Janet Schwartz Evans have invited us to, to their home. Everyone here is invited. It's just over on Ashland, and we'll meet everybody there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much.